we're very fortunate to have Professor Kevin Schultz here with us today. Uh, he's a University of Illinois Chicago associate professor, about to be a full professor, uh, of Catholic studies, religious studies, and he's also president of the Society for U.S. Intellectual History, which is a really fantastic organization. has probably the best blog of any history blog that I know of, uh, S-U-S-I-H, uh, USIH.org. Um, a native of Los Angeles, uh, Kevin Schultz lives in Chicago. He teaches 20th century American history with special interest in religion, ethno-racial history, uh, and American intellectual and cultural life. He's published really widely and prolifically some re uh, quite amazing work. Uh, he's given numerous invited talks. His first book is an exceptional study that I had the privilege of getting to read some of in his draft forms. Uh, it's entitled Tri-Faith America, How Post-War Catholics and Jews Held America to Its Protestant Promise, published by Oxford in 2011 and now out of paperback. Uh, it charts the decline of the idea of the U.S. as a Christian nation and the subsequent rise of the notion that the country was premised on a tri-faith idea that came to be called Judeo-Christianity. This is a great power and significance in American political and intellectual life. And Kevin Schultz's book really documents that um, for the first time uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that's impacted the field um, quite substantially. Uh, and it also impacts how I teach it for anyone here who's, uh, who's taken any of my classes. <coughs> Schultz is also a beautiful writer. His prose is fantastic. So if you haven't uh, bought his book uh, on Mailer and Buckley, you might want to. Um, he makes really complicated subjects accessible and interesting, uh, which is very rare uh, for any writer of any kind, uh, much less for someone who's doing serious historical archival work and trying to reach broad audiences. Uh, so lately he's focused on the 1960s, and this most recent book of his Buckley and Mailer, The Difficult Friendship That Shaped the 1960s, came out in last summer, summer 2015, and was an Amazon number one new release in U.S. history. It's been really widely reviewed. I could list a lot of the places it's been reviewed. Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe, New York Review of Books, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, The New Yorker, and on and on. All the places that we all aspire to be reviewed. Been reviewed. Uh, and very positively and favorably at that. Uh, he's also the author of a fantastic textbook, his. Uh, so on top of all the other stuff, he's got textbooks. Um, we actually met, though, many years ago when I was finishing my dissertation, and he was finishing, uh, he had just finished his uh, PhD. Uh, and so I count him also as a friend, as well as a fellow scholar, traveler. Uh, and so it's a great pleasure to be able to host him here in Corvallis. Uh, hopefully uh, he will impress you uh, as much as he has impressed me. And hopefully we all will be able to impress him with our thoughts and ruminations uh, in Q&A, uh, as much as I hope uh, and aspire. So without further ado, uh, please help me in welcoming Kevin Schultz for what I hope will be a fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for coming out. Thank you, Chris, for not calling me the greatest lover since Casanova. Um, I was wanted to know, how did Bill Buckley know he was the greatest lover since Casanova? Like, well, you know, call him out on it or something like that. But um, next time, Chris, you can call me the greatest lover since Casanova. That would be fine. I'd like to thank the uh, Department of History, Philosophy, and Religion, which is doing all sorts of great stuff. Um, for the undergraduates here, I just want to throw a pitch for that department, um, which is you know my world. Here at OSU, you have a real uh, talented crop of nationwide recognized scholars um, in your department in my field. Like it's a little intimidating for me to come give this talk here at OSU because you here have some of the cream of the crop, and I would strongly encourage you to take advantage of them. I mean, not just Chris, who's sort of my friend, so I have to say that, but also people who I don't know who might be sitting out in the audience. Take advantage of it because it's a real um, nice thing to have. So I um, just want to throw that out there. Um, ben, in the, in the department, thank you very much for helping me uh, come out here. And then especially the, the Citizenship in Crisis um, series, of which this is one of the talks. I think, um, you know, there are only a handful of real problems in American society right now. And you look at the ongoing presidential race and you just see like the anger and the frustration of the population. And a lot of people want to contribute and they don't know how. Um, and I think dealing with citizenship in crisis is just right up this alleyway. Um, and then my talk, in being a history guy, my talk is about the 1960s. 
And I think I can make a pretty good case for the break that we have in our politics today that you all have inherited um, has its origins 50 years ago in the 1960s. The arguments that guys like Bill Buckley or Norman Mailer, my two characters, were having were, are, are some of the same arguments over laissez-faire economics, over the good of the commonweal, over what role does the individual play in this big, massive society. So um, I think it's just a great service to the university. You guys are very lucky to have that as, as, as part of just what's going on here at Oregon State. So that's enough for my thanks. Um, if you'll indulge me for a second, you, you got kind of a taste of who William Buckley, you know, this sort of very prestigious right-wing conservative who sticks his tongue out like a snake all the time, has this expansive vocabulary, um, you know, this sort of conservative par excellence, and then Norman Naylor, this sort of like five foot seven, pugnacious guy, looks like he's going to punch you in the nose when he's talking. You got a sense of who these guys are, and that was about the sense that I had of who they were when I started the project that became this book um, that just came out not too long ago. Um, so I knew little more about them than you did. And if, if you let me sort of build myself, I'd like to start with, with reading parts of a letter. And this was the very first letter that I saw between these guys. And it's really what kicked off this, this, this whole thing. Um, and I think more than kicking off sort of a book about you know, a, a bromance between two guys, it also showed me that by telling the story of this, of this bromance, I might be able to answer the most important question of the 1960s. Um, so that's a lot, I know. So you guys can tell me I failed later or not. But that's what my goal was. You know, you might as well aim big, right? So here's the letter. Dear Bill, wrote Norman Mailer in 1965. So this is 50 years ago, 51 now. Um, I write you this letter in great envy. I think you are going finally to displace me as the most hated man in America. And of course, that position is bearable only if one is number one. To be the second most hated man in the picture will probably prove to be a little like working behind a mule for years. Right? And you know, when you work behind a mule, right? you get that, right? That's Norman Mailer. Luckily, he almost certainly laughed at the line. He had a great sense of humor. He almost certainly laughed at the line as he did dozens of other lines that, that Mailer wrote him. They were really funny. They were so mean to each other, but they were really funny. Um, but this letter that I found had just a ton of substance. It was like four pages, single spaced long, it had a ton of substance. And this particular letter was sent to Bill Buckley, William F. Buckley Jr., to say his name properly, um, just days after he gave what I think is probably the most toxic speech that he ever gave. It was a speech to a, a collection of New York City cops. Um, the Holy Name Society, the Catholic Order, invited a bunch of Catholic cops. And because like 90% of the New York City police force is Catholic, this was the largest gathering of police. And Buckley was invited to prop them up. This was right after the summer riots in New York in 64 and 65. And most importantly, it was just weeks after the debacle at Selma, right? Um, you all probably, many of you I hope, have seen the movie Selma um, and know that the atrocious actions of the police when they sort of beat down the civil rights marchers with billy sticks and with um, all sorts of guns, weapons, things like that, it's just totally indefensible. How can you defend the cops who align themselves with the Ku Klux Klan to beat a peaceful civil rights march, right? But that's what Buckley tried to do in this speech. Um, and his speech was more along the lines of, well, what did you expect to happen? Of course the white cops in Selma are going to beat these civil rights marchers. Is anybody surprised? The police are here to keep order. And when order threatens to be destabilized, well, what do the police do? The police keep order. So the police were acting in the right in doing what they did in Selma, right? It sounds just as bad, it sounded just as bad in 1965 as it sounds now. And so the newspapers throughout New York, they just drew their knives and they slayed Bill Buckley for siding with the cops of Selma. How on earth can you do this? And Buckley was totally taken aback. And he had discovered that one of the fathers of the Holy Name Society had recorded, audio recorded, his talk. And so he thought that he could get the recording 
play it for the press, and then they would realize that they were mischaracterizing his speech. <laughs> so he sends some poor staff or some poor assistant to go to meet Father whoever at, at, at the Holy Name Society, get the tape, and he hastily calls together this press release. So this poor staffer, like a 22-year-old kid or whatever, shows up, 22-year-old young adult, I apologize. 22-year-old young adult shows up with the tape and he walks into the room, it's a he of course, walks into the room and it's filled with a hundred reporters and cameras and everything like that. And he just sort of sheepishly hands over the tape, they hit play, and here's Bill Buckley doing his thing. And then, right at the moment when he's about to talk about Selma, the tape breaks. And everybody leans in, and this poor staffer is sweating, he's sitting there pushing the button, tape still broken. One of the cameramen comes from the back, they start futzing with it, and about five minutes later they find, okay, we got the tape fixed, here it is. And suspiciously enough, there's 30 seconds missing from the tape, and it was the 30 seconds where he had talked about Selma. So now the newspaper reporters are angrier than they were before, and they wrote even worse headlines the next day. You know, racist Bill Buckley sides with Selma once again, right? And in that moment, right, that's when Norman Mailer writes this letter to his friend. Um, you know, I write you this letter in great envy. You're the most hated man in America. But the letter goes on, and that's what was so rich about this letter. Um, after spending a few pages describing the errors that Buckley made in trying to defend Selma, um, and in spending a few pages also trying to um, talk about how difficult it is to be a police officer, having to make split-second decisions on do you proceed violently or not. I mean, is there anything more topical today than dealing with that question, right? And here's Norman Mailer dealing with it. And then Norman Mailer concludes the letter in a great way, and he says, listen, I think our public debating days are probably over, for a time at least. As wrestlers, we're now both villains, and that excites no proper passions. I always imagine like two bad guys in the World Wrestling Federation, like nobody cares, but if you have a good guy and a bad guy, then you're really excited. Still, this may open something interesting, which is that the two of us have a long, careful, private discussion one night. Because I think in all modesty, there's much in your thought which is innocent of its own implications. And there's much surplus in my thought which could profitably be sliced away by the powers of your logic. And what he's trying to do is save William F. Buckley's conservatism from devolving into sort of brutal law and order violence, right? Um, and he's also offering to learn from Bill Buckley how his left-wingerism can be saved from Pollyanna visions of what humanity is capable of. Um, it was this real rich, genuine letter and an attempt to learn from somebody who is your political enemy in some ways. Um, and then he signed the letter, Incorrigibly Yours, Norman. And that, that was almost the title for the book, Incorrigibly <laughs> Yours. And my editor's like, no. But um, I thought that was, that was great. <laughs> Incorrigibly Yours, right? Well, Buckley gets this letter, and he writes back immediately. Dear Bill, I want to thank you for your warm and amusing letter. And anyway, I have a lot more to teach you than merely how to reason. And Bill Buckley still didn't get it, you know, it's like, come on, man. And then he says, and I love this part as a postscript, he says, can I quote that part of the letter that refers to the shameful detestations of the press, how the press had wronged him? Can I use you, my left-wing friend, to, but, to fight back against the press? And Mailer, of course, writes back immediately and says, no. He says, no, you can't use me because then I'm going to be aligned with the cops at Selma and I'm not going to become a clanner just because I'm defending you. And so when Buckley does write about this incident and he writes about everything, which is a real boon to historians, um, he leaves out Mailer's part. And that essay gets collected in a book about nine months later. And I love this find in the archive. He sends a copy of the book to Norman Mailer that has this essay about Selma in it, in which Mailer is not quoted. And in the index of the book, where I think he knew Norman Mailer was going to look first, right under the name Mailer, Buckley took a pen and wrote a smiley face, and it says, hi! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were so mean to each other. <laughs> Buckley then signs his letter, corrigibly yours, Bill. Right? Screw you. That's great. 
Okay, now, now I beg your forgiveness for telling this sort of long story right off the bat, but for me, it's what started the whole, the whole project, the big questions that I was going after. It was about five or six years ago, I was sitting in bed. When you get a little older, sometimes you have sleepless nights, you might discover. I was having one of these, and I was reading a magazine. And Norman Mailer had just died, and he had just sold his papers to the, um, the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas for $2.5 million, which you, know, you gotta pay a lot of child support with that. So he, um, eight kids. So he sold it for $2.5 million, and this magazine published some of the letters, and one of the letters was the one that I just, just read to you. And I sat straight up in bed when I read this. Here was Norman Mailer, who most of you probably don't know who it was, but I had this sort of inkling of who he was. He was sort of the infant terrible of the post-World War II American left. He was a novelist and writer. His real best form was writing essays, political essays, and the best character in his stories was always himself. Um, you, know, you could speak about the ego of the guy. But he, he, he was on the left, and he wrote novels that had lots of bad words in them intentionally. He's trying to push American society. This was before this happened all the time. Um, his first most famous book, um, The Naked and the Dead, which some people still consider to be the best World War II book ever written, a novel from an American perspective, it uses like hundreds of times the word F-U-G um, because you couldn't use the real word. And he was trying to depict how American soldiers really talked. So he used that word a lot. Um, in the late 60s, there was a band called The Thugs because they loved Norman Mailer's <laughs> writing style. So here he was, and there were sex scenes, like graphic sex scenes, which I don't need to describe because you get plenty of that on your day-to-day -day basis. Um, he advocated socialism in some of his books. I mean, here's a guy on the left <coughs> pushing all sorts of boundaries. He was an iconoclast. He was a libertine, booze all the time, drugs all the time. Um, he was the husband to six women, the lover to countless more. Um, one of the great benefits of having going around the country giving this talk is being approached by like 85-year-old women who talk about the time Norman Mailer seduced them in 1959. It's just both cool and very weird at the same time. Um, he once stabbed his wife with a four-inch pen knife during a drunken fight. Um, it missed her heart by millimeters, and she still didn't divorce him for a year later and didn't press charges. Um, he was five foot seven inches tall and just pugnacious. He had this barrel chest that sort of entered the room before he did. Holy crap, here's Norman Mailer, somebody who's going to use bad words, talk about graphic sex scenes, and really push things in our face. Well, how could somebody who was that sort of extreme on the left pushing boundaries be friends with somebody like William F. Buckley Jr., who was sort of a mirror image on the right, the enfant terrible of the American right in the 1950s and 60s. He was a traditionalist who loved to sail. He had the sailor's cap that he wore all the time. He was the founder of this magazine called National Review, which is still in circulation. And before um, like Fox News and the right-wing media that we have today came around, there were only a handful of right-wing outlets, and National Review was the king of them all. Like, it starts in 1955, and it was Buckley's journal. He was the founding editor. It taught Ronald Reagan how to be a conservative, for instance. Um, and Ronald Reagan said that many times. Um, Buckley was also the host of Firing Line, which you got a little glimpse of before we started. And um, you know he had he, he crafted the talking points of the right for 30 years from 1950 through the 1970s and into the 1980s. Now, how could these two guys be friends? That's what really popped me propped me up at night when I saw that. Um, and yet there was this letter right that showed compassion and friendship and joking and caring and humor and knowingness and all the stuff that makes that makes friends. Um, and not only were they friends, and this was the beauty of it all, especially for us history nerds, not only were they friends, but they were debating all the major topics in American life, in letters and on TV. They were debating everything that came through the United States. Um, so I go to the archives, and I find dozens and dozens of letters. 
And most of these letters are when, when their friendship was most fertile were in these key decades, the early 1960s, the late 1960s, and into the 1970s. And they were debating not only you know, who was right and who was wrong, but like they were debating big questions. Like what kind of life is worth living? Like America is rich and fat after World War II. How can we use that wealth to allow our citizens to live a more fulfilling life? Like that's what they were debating, right? Um, sometimes it got esoteric and they got sidetracked, and sometimes they got right down to the nub of it, and it was beautiful. Oh, these letters were really, really good. Um, and it was at that moment when I read these letters that I realized I had a potential way to answer what is, I think, the most troubling question of the 1960s. People are always asking us historians to think big, we might as well. And the big question of the 1960s has to be, um, how do the citizens of the richest, most powerful nation that the world has ever seen by the end of the 1960s find themselves at each other's throats so violently and viscerally divided? Like, how does that happen? Why does that happen? Um, and what are the results? Uh, and to give away the answer, we're living with the results today. Um, and that's what I set out to answer in this, in this book. But before I found out that my hunch that I might have a way to answer this question might be right, I dug in the archives and learned all these amazing things about their friendship. Um, and it was so fun. These guys were like idiots. They were funny, they were smart, they were everywhere. Anybody you can possibly imagine in the 1960s, they knew and were friendly with. Um, any protest, they were there writing about, participating in, and they were so funny as to how they went about um, discussing this. Uh, the reviewer for the, the Times of London, when he reviewed this book a couple months ago, he said, Kevin Schultz evidently had a lot of fun writing this book, and so did I reading it. I was like, I won! I did it! I did what I set out to do, because it sure was fun to write. So I'm glad that this the person at least had fun reading it. I mean, these stories, they're so good. And they're going to parties, they're drinking, there's Frank Sinatra, there's Mia Farrow, there's Truman Capote, there's Joan Didion, all these characters, Gloria Steinem, all these characters were part of their lives. It was just part of the circles that they were swimming in. And what are they debating? Civil rights movement, Vietnam, women's rights movement, student protests of the 60s, the Cold War. I mean, everything that was big and transformative in the late 1960s, that was their subject matter. And it was all right there in these letters. It was great. Um, the first men, the, the guys first, these two men first met in 1962. It was showbiz that brought them together. Um, Mailer was already famous for The Naked and the Dead, the book with all the fugs in it, the FUGs in it, um, and for his outspoken sort of left-wing politics that first emerged really in a really great book of 1959. I love the title, Advertisements for Myself. Um, and what it was, it was a collection of his essays that he was trying to get rid of so he could work on his next big book. But he realized that nobody wanted to see a collection of his old stuff. So he wrote italicized... Um, entries and conclusions to each piece, and in those italicized advertisements, that's what he called them, he basically described why the youth of the 1950s were so angry. I mean, you've heard of Rebel Without a Cause, right? Here's Norman Mailer telling you why the rebel is angry, and they actually do have a cause. Holden Caulfield might have had an itch, and here's Norman Mailer telling you what they're trying to scratch. Right? It was a, and it, it catapulted him to be this sort of iconic, youthful figure on the radical left. Um, Buckley was famous too already. He had this early famous book in 1951 called God and Man at Yale, which basically sets the tone of modern conservatism to this very day. Um, nanny state economics needs to get away from the individual who needs to go strive for often his, but his or her own sort of benefits. And um, situational secular ethics is not right. We need to honor our Christian heritage, right? So if these two things sound familiar on the conservative party today, here it is in 1951. Bill Buckley is spelling it out for the rest of America. He also usefully came up with the phrase the liberal establishment, 
which is still in currency today. Um, he hated the middle. He hated the American middle. Um, and he s sort of derisively called it the, Amer the liberal establishment. So that's Buckley. Thank you very much for that. And then the parallels between these two guys, not only were they famous, they became kind of like odd, really <laughs> shockingly weird. They were born within a few years of each other, uh, within a few miles of each other. They were mostly shielded from the worst, uh, in, in the early 1920s is when they were born. They were mostly shielded from the worst of the Great Depression. They both fought in World War II, but joined sort of when the battles were over and they fought on the periphery of action. Both had early fame. Both even within weeks of each other, literally within three weeks of each other, they start founding journals. Um, Buckley, as I mentioned, with National Review, starts in fall of 1955. And Norman Mailer starts uh, The Village Voice in New York, which is, I guess was, when I mention it to people in New York, they say it's not that important anymore. But once upon a time, it was a prominent sort of ironic voice of the radical left in New York City. And that was Norman Mailer. And they start these magazines within three weeks of each other. And like I said, these sort of parallels got a little bit creepy. Well, at their first meeting, it was um, a, a producer who brought them together, uh, this guy named John Golden, whose name was actually Robert Golden, but he didn't think anybody named Robert ever got really big in this life, so he changed his name to John. And the reporter who overheard them was like, what are you talking about? He proposed that they have a debate between Robert Frost and Robert Graves with Robert Kennedy moderating to see if the Roberts really could get big. <laughs> but Golden was no dummy. He wanted to bring a person, an iconic young person on the, the right, Bill Buckley, and an iconic young person on the left, Norman Mailer, together to say, okay, we've got these young people, these rebels without a cause, these holding call fields. Who's going to lead the path forward, the left or the right? Let's have Norman Mailer and Bill Buckley debate the future. And so he brought them together in Chicago, uh, my fair city now to debate the future. But Golden was no dummy, despite changing his name. Um, he was no dummy. He timed this debate to happen two days before this heavyweight boxing match between Sonny Liston and Floyd Patterson. And this is back when like, people cared about boxing. It was um, a big deal. I guess ever since Tyson, nobody's really cared about boxing. But this was back in the day when boxing mattered, right? when a young guy named Muhammad Ali was beginning to make a name for himself. This is right before that moment. And so, he knew, Golden knew, that there would be all these reporters uh, at, at, to cover the fight. And so two days earlier, why not come down and listen to Bill Buckley and Norman Mailer debate each other? And the reporters came. 3,500 people filled the Grand Medina Theater in Chicago. There were posters all over town. I have a picture of one in the book. It was billed like a, like a title fight, you know, Buckley v. Mailer. It was billed the same way. The sports reporters actually uh, took bets. Uh, Buckley was favored. Um, six to six to three to one, I think was no two and a half to one were the odds that Buckley would win, and the debate didn't disappoint. It was really fun to read, actually. They uh, were they just like wanted to beat each other up from the very beginning. So Bill Buckley gets up and he starts, and he says, "I don't think I can keep Norman Mailer's interest very long, especially as I described the right wing, because us conservatives don't have enough sexual neuroses to entertain Norman Mailer." But I'll try and be interesting enough to get him to raise his eyes from the world's genital glands. <laughs> that was the first line of the debate, right? I'm like, this is going to be amazing. And it was. They went and they argued the Cold War, the civil rights movement, uh, the role of religion in American public life. They debated all sorts of things. Um, and then they had this, you know, these folk singers who were invited to do this half the, the intermission entertainment. I can't imagine, like, peaceful guitar, acoustic guitars, and these guys just coming out and battling each other. After the intermission, uh, the new wine folk singers, after the intermission, they were asking each other questions. And Buckley was this incredibly skilled debater. He was the best ever to come out of the Ivy Leagues. Um, he was the Ivy League champion at Yale where he went. And he, they sent him to England, and he just destroyed Cambridge and Oxford. He was just a world-class, literally a world-class debater. And so he was trying to corner Norman Mailer into all these positions about the Cold War. Did you think these people who are behind the Iron Curtain should deserve to have these awful lives, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and he was using these old quotations to the point where Mailer was getting so frustrated. Mailer eventually just throws his hands in the air 
And he says, you can, if you want me to lay down and you can run over me with the railroad of your logic, that's fine. But if you want to sit here and debate what I want to debate, let's get to it. And what I want to debate, and I love this line, is the nature of man. Right? Why are we here? What is our purpose? And how can we live fulfilling lives? And if this was a cartoon, there would be a huge light bulb that goes off over William F. Buckley's head. Because he just stopped talking. And to the shock of everyone, he cedes the rest of his time to Norman Naylor. Now, Bill Buckley loved to talk. He could fill the air with anything for hours and hours and hours. Everybody's sitting there saying he's, he's ceding his time to Norman Naylor. Even Naylor protested. What, what do you mean? But nonetheless, he cedes the rest of his time. Mailer does this mop-up job, and then um, all the sports reporters had to exchange a lot of money because at the end of the debate, Norman Mailer had won by a vote of six to three to one. Um, and Mailer wasn't sure what happened until a couple weeks later, and he gets a phone call. And it's from Bill Buckley. And Buckley said, we have some business to attend to. Um, why don't you come up to my house up in Connecticut and we can discuss this business? They could have done it with lawyers or over the phone or anything like that, but he invited him up to his house. So Mailer says, sure. So Mailer goes, he's in a motorcycle with a white t-shirt, and like, you know, he's a rebel, right? And he shows up and they go and they discuss business. Um, Playboy magazine had offered to buy the rights to the debate. And so now, um, this leads to one of my more embarrassing research moments when I'm sitting there looking at old microfilm in the library of Playboy magazines with like grainy breasts up on the stage, like quickly scrolling through and stuff like that. So Playboy magazine actually publishes these debates in, in 63. But they, they, they go over the transcript really quickly. And then Buckley turns to Baylor and he says, how much time do you have? I, you know, I drove an hour up here, I got plenty of time. Let's go sailing. And Mailer's like, what the hell are you talking about? Let's go sailing. And so sure enough, they drive down to the dock in Stanford, Connecticut. They get on this 34-foot sloop, and they do Buckley's famous sail across the Connecticut Sound for three, it's a three-hour cruise, right? Three-hour tour, or whatever it is. <laughs> and I wish they had a tape recorder on the boat, but they didn't. So I, I have I, have all, like, I want to make up what they talked about. But what I do know is when they got off the boat, the boat they, were, they were fast uh, buddies. They were friends. I know they got hammered. I know that much. Because <laughs> um, that made it into the documentary evidence. Um, but I don't know what they talked about. What I do know is that in the weeks, months, and years after their sailing trip, there are dozens of letters firing back and forth. Uh, Buckley, uh, Mailer becomes friends with Buckley's wife. They come up with nicknames for each other. He called her Slugger because she was such a tough lady. And she called him Chuki Ba Lamb, which she learned from her Swedish, I mean Swedish, her Scottish nanny, which means like sweet little sheep or something like that, which is a weird name for Norman Mailer. But I have these letters. As, it's a, Dear CBL, and it took me weeks of trying to figure out what the hell that meant. But there are multiple letters to CBL. It's Chuki Ba Lamb. Go figure, OK? Um, they became friends. So I spent some time trying to figure out, OK, why are they friends? Like, how could these two political enemies be friends? And I came up with, like, with a bunch of ideas. One, they're both white, Ivy League educated men at a time when it was white, Ivy League educated men who felt comfortable talking on behalf of the nation. Like, they just had that instant connection right there. And more interestingly, or as interestingly, Mailer was sort of a secular Jew, and Buckley was a practicing Catholic. But neither, the point is, were sort of mainstream establishment Protestants. So even though they were white Ivy League educated men, they were sort of on the outside of that sort of position of power. So they had that in common. Second, they both had a deep love of the United States, like a really deep love of the United States. Mailer called it a searing love of country. And they thought when the country lived up to its better angels, there was no better country in the world. And they both took it as their mission to get the country to live up to their better angels. Um, and thirdly, and this might be the most important part, is that they both 
hated the mainstream middle in America. One from the left, looking at all those sort of white picket fences and leave it to beaver, just hating that society. Um, you know, as a secular Jew with sort of middle class aspirational parents, he just thought life was much more rewarding than what that mainstream leave it to beaver life had to offer. Whereas Mailer thought the nanny state was too, I mean, Buckley thought the nanny state was too strong and he hated the sort of um, kind of corporate capitalism that existed in the 1950s. So from the left and the right, they both hated the middle. And then the fourth reason that they might have liked each other is that they both sort of wanted to be celebrities and they realized that they could be the yin to the other person's yang. And they could do debates like this where they could talk about Casanova and tell jokes and it would propel both of them into the spotlight. Um, they never admitted that, but it's hard to sort of see that as anything but a big part of their friendship. Um, once they met, you know, they were like, even though I freaking hate the movie Forrest Gump, um, it's like a moral and historical abomination, but they were sort of like Forrest Gump where they show up at every important event of the 1960s. Here they are debating James Baldwin in 1964-65 about the civil rights movement, with Baldwin thinking Mailer's wrong, just like all the left who are overly sexualizing black people and thereby diminishing the possibilities of 16 million Americans. But he also hates the right conservative um, Buckley. There's a great debate between Buckley and Baldwin that you can watch on YouTube now, well, I mean, after the talk. Um, but it's, it's a, this great debate about these two powerful intellects debating the civil rights movement in 1965. And Buckley trying his hardest to defend that conservative position that black people are not civilized enough, his words, not mine, for democracy. They need to get better educated. Right? And that also, they hadn't pulled themselves up by the bootstraps the same way that the Irish or the Italians or the Poles had. You know, completely ignoring 300 years of structural uh, institutionalized racism. Um, and it's hard to deny that those arguments have left some facets of modern American conservatism today. So here they are debating James Baldwin. Here they are debating the Vietnam War. Here they are at the 1964 convention talking about Barry Goldwater, who's introducing modern American conservatism to the Republican Party, right? They're both there. Um, they both have their own troubles with Barry Goldwater. And there's this great letter from Buckley to Mailer where he says, I shudder to think about what you're going to write about that august convention, right? I mean, they both, they're, they're there. They were just sort of everywhere. Um, both of men decide to run for mayor of New York City um, in different years. So they got to cover the other one, which is great. In 1965, here's William F. Buckley running for mayor of New York City. Um, the great line that Norman Mailer writes about his conservative Bill Buckley friend is, no one, I suspect, is more majestically unsuited for becoming mayor since it is possible old Bill has never been in the subway in his life. <laughs> Buckley's personality is the highest camp we're ever going to find in the mayorality. No other actor on earth can project simultaneous hints that he is in the act of playing Commodore of the Yacht Club. A little inside joke, right? Joseph Goebbels. Robert Mitchum, who had just played like this rapist anti-hero, uh, Maverick, Savernolton, Narola, this conservative Catholic, and the nice prep school kid next door, as well as the snows of yesteryear. If he didn't talk about politics, if he was just the most camp gun ever to walk into gun smoke, I'd give up my Saturday nights to watch Bill Buckley. But he does talk about politics time to time. And his program for New York City is to drop an atom bomb post haste on the atom bomb of the Chinese. A man like that cannot be kept from getting an enormous minority vote. And he was right. Um, of course, Mailer said, Buckley's votes will not come from people who even know what the word camp means. No, his sort of votes will come from the kinds of girls who want to work at Bell Telephone their whole lives. Um, he means the angry, sort of white, working classes. And Buckley, of course, not only spectacularly loses the election, but he steals enough votes from the law and order Democrat, Abe Beam, so that his arch enemy, John Lindsay, wins the mayorality of New York City in 1965. Buckley was pissed. 
Um, but Richard Nixon and lots of other Republican strategists watched this election very closely. And the sort of Southern strategy that Nixon develops and the silent majority of this sort of angry white working class who vote for Buckley, that, those become the voters that Nixon starts to court in 1968. And you can argue that some facets of the Republican Party have trying, been trying to court ever since. Sure enough, four years later, here's Norman Mailer running for New York City. I mean, this stuff it couldn't be written for me any better. It was perfect. Um, his main promise was to have the city of New York secede from the state of New York. Um, if you walk around New York City today, you'll still see buttons that say 51 on them, the 51st state. This harkens back to the Mailer um, attempted, uh, well, the Mailer campaign. One of his slogans um, was throw the bums in. There were all sorts of, like, they, they were at racetracks, like they were at all the great places where you would want a politician to be. He too loses spectacularly, and he manages to steal enough votes from the only progressive, a guy named Herman Padillo, so that the mainstream liberal, John Lindsay, gets reelected in 1969. <laughs> So they both, from their respective positions, steal enough votes from their, their own parties that John Lindsay gets elected both times. Um, they almost got in a fist fight together in 1966 over the Vietnam War. I really wish they would have gotten in a fist fight. Um, it would have been great for my book. But it didn't happen because Mailer was too drunk. It was at Truman Capote's famous black and white ball in 1966. Mailer is drunk and angry. He saw McGeorge Bundy, sort of former national secretary advisor, I mean, uh, security advisor, an advocate of Vietnam War, and he wants to go pick a fight with McGeorge Bundy. Um, his friend, the poet and writer Lillian Hellman, steps in and says, what are you doing, Norman? And she talked him down in front of everybody. Mailer said, let's go downstairs and fight. Mailer goes to the bar after Lillian Hellman sort of made him feel like a, his line was the younger brother to an older sister. And um, he has about seven or 12 more drinks, and he wants to get in a fight. And he sees William Buckley over in the corner, and he walks over to him and says, put up your dukes. <laughs> and Mailer looks at him and is like, what the hell are you talking about? And he says, put up your dukes. We're going to fight about Vietnam. <laughs> and Buckley looks at him and sees how drunk he is, and he just puts his arm around him, and they go and walk off. This is a beautiful moment, in a way. I, it would have been better for sales of my book if they actually <laughs> fought, but they didn't. Um, and of course, they're also at those political conventions from 1968. Um, the one where Richard Nixon gets uh, nominated and he eventually goes on to become president in 68. A lot of us have impressions of the 60s as sort of the hippies and the radical left. It's really good to remember that in 1968, Richard Milhouse Nixon was elected president. Um, to show the counterbalance of the left and the right fighting one another. And of course, they were both in Chicago in 1968, um, which many of you may not know about, but it was probably one of the more um, violent political conventions in definitely 20th century American history, if not all of American history. It's where Mayor Daley of Chicago promised to keep law and order in the streets, and by which he meant he was going to have the police force beat the hell out of all the anti-Vietnam War protesters who were uh, advocating a peace plank outside. And so the great image that you can see today on television is of split screens. One screen is inside the convention hall where all the delegates are voting, and the other screen are these light blue helmeted police just beating the crap out of a bunch of anti-Vietnam War protesters. Um, one of the, the, the um, speakers inside the hall referred to it as the Gestapo tactics going on out in the streets of Chicago. It was a really divisive campaign. And of course, both Buckley and Mailer are there. Uh, Mailer is torn. He looks at those hippies and says, those people are not a responsible left. But Mayor Daley is not a responsible right. I have to choose between the irresponsible left and the irresponsible right. And ironically enough, Bill Buckley feels the same way, and he loses his center. Uh, in one of the more most famous television episodes in, in political American political history, um, ABC television had brought Bill Buckley to debate Gore Vidal during the conventions. 
And so again, the split screens, the cops are beating the crap out of the protesters outside. And then here you've got a lefty and a righty. And uh, uh, Gore Vidal says uh, something like, look at those crypto-Nazi techniques going on outside. And Buckley says, don't you think that's a little strong? And Vidal says, well, the only crypto-Nazi I can think of sitting in this room is you. And Buckley says, God damn you, queer, I'll punch you in the face if you keep calling me a, this is on live TV, if you keep calling me a crypto-Nazi and you'll stay plastered. And the, the guy, the poor host on ABC television, this guy's tied, he's like, oh, let's not call each other names. And they got, they started calling each other, you goddamn queer. I mean, it was, there was a documentary that was, um, The Best of Enemies is what it's called, that was a pretty popular last year, that um, was pretty, it was an okay documentary, but it took this moment and told the history of the 60s through this moment. Um, and then what happens is really interesting. By the 1970s, these guys start to become less famous in a way. They're still famous, but they're no longer so critical to the times. Um, my favorite example comes from, uh, uh, in 1971, a toy company wanted to do um, cards of all the famous political actors of the era. And so there's Richard Nixon wearing this red robe, holding a staff and nothing else. Um, and, and he's the king of spades. And his wife, Pat Nixon, is the queen of spades. And in this deck, there are two jokers. It's Bill Buckley and Norman Mailer. And the drawings became the cover of, of the book. These were the drawings that they sent over. Um, and in 1976, in another example, this television show, Good Morning America, they invite Buckley and Mailer to come to debate um, the 1976 presidential election. And Buckley starts thinking back, 14 years earlier, we had been the dominant force for 3,500 people for two hours in Chicago. Now we're going to be on Good Morning America. How much time do we have? And the producers from Good Morning America say, six minutes. And he says, no, 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 I, oh, I won't do it. So what do you mean? You can't say anything in six minutes. So they huddle up and they give him 11 minutes. And nobody recorded anything that either of them said during those 11 minutes on Good Morning America. And in fact, the most memorable thing that happens is after they have breakfast after Good Morning America, they go down to the street corner to hail a cab for Mailer. And they're looking at the street corner, and there's this station wagon that's sort of out of control. And it looks like it's coming right for them. And right at the moment when it's about to hit him, it veers off. And the window goes down. And it's Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who had just been elected to the Senate from New York on that very, he would be elected that very day. And he rolls his window down and he says, damn, I could have got you both with one swipe. <laughs> That's the most memorable moment from that debate. So piecing all this together, and to get back to the big question before, before I let you ask some, some questions, um, how does this relate to that, that big question? How do the richest, I mean, how do the people in the richest society human history has ever known get, go to each other's throats within the matter of a short decade? And um, to give it away, the answer is, is freedom. And freedom, I think, is the key word to understand what happens in the 1960s. Um, when the times were good, the economy was mostly pretty good. Both the left and the right, as symbolized by Buckley and Mailer, demand more freedom. Mailer's freedom was that of the left, of freedom of speech, I mean, he, the thug thing, right? Freedom of social expectations, the Jewish aspirational longings to have the white picket fence and stuff. He didn't want any of that. He thought it was totally unfulfilling. He wanted to have a more fulfilling America out there. Um, he wanted to be sort of freed from the pretension of social expectation, which I know we all feel today, especially when you're a young adult trying to figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life, right? And he wanted what those expectations were to be different than what he had felt as a young man in the 40s and in the 50s. But Buckley's cause was also freedom, but of a different kind. He wanted freedom from the state, freedom from high taxes, freedom from sort of the liberal assumptions that guided American life. Um, he wanted freedom from the government telling us what the good life was. Um, 
you know, he had this very opulent background, a house with 114 rooms, six pianos in it, private tutors. He really wanted to conserve that kind of life that he thought was being threatened. And over the course of the 1960s, what they narrated, what they wrote about, what they participated in, was a debate about freedom. How much freedom could Americans have? What would it look like? And how much freedom, and this was the key question, could you have without it affecting the common good? How much freedom could you claim for yourself, could a person claim for him or herself, without feeling disconnected from the rest of society? And by the time they began to gauge the costs of that question, they started to look out at the revolutions they had spawned, the hippies, who all they wanted to do, the catchphrase of the 60s is, do your own thing, right? Well, if you do your own thing, you're not contributing to the commonweal at all. Or if you push too far against high taxes in a libertarian ethos, well, you're, there's no money left over to pay for public schools or roads or hospitals or anything like that. And that's how I came to the answer of my question, which is the sort of mostly buried thesis of my book. For the story, it's not just this strange romance, although that's really the fun part of the story, but it's also a way to understand the 1960s. It explains why so much change happens so quickly. Nobody was defending the middle. Nobody was defending the commonweal. The left was radicalizing over personal freedoms, and the right was radicalizing over economic freedoms. And with nobody defending the center, cracks began to appear in how people understood what it meant to be a citizen in the United States. Freedom in America is a really powerful word. Um, maybe the most powerful political clarion call we have. Nobody wants to deny anybody their freedoms. Not in America. And so it was very hard to push back against that. And we've seen that ramification today. Uh, you know, I think of uh, Elizabeth Warren and even Barack Obama a little bit talking about that you didn't build that campaign. Somebody paid for those roads or those state schools for your employees to get educated, things like that. I don't know how much traction that had, but that was an attempt to create a language that was against sort of this lionization of individual freedoms. And so what happens is with the lionization of freedoms, the set of assumptions by which we live today uh, come into existence. So instead of like a corporate capitalist environment where the richest 1% are paying really high amounts of taxes, where the general sense is, and do you all know this line, what's good for General Motors is good for the country and vice versa? In the late 1960s and early 1970s, that breaks apart. And now we want laissez-faire economics with low amounts of taxes. And what's good for General Motors might be for it to move its factories to Mexico and might not be so good for the United States. But that's the ethos in which we live. Or another way to think about it, sort of from the left, is we're searching for traditions, you know, to make America great again, this one clarion call, oh, great again for who? What's the diverse multicultural tradition that we can glom onto today that will have traction? And it's sort of, a, instead of banging certain rules about words we use, ways that we address our um, superiors, you know, we don't even like to use that word, or how short your hair should be, or what clothes you should wear. Um, you know, if you look at the 1950s television shows, men were obeying rules as to how they were to appear. And now what's carried the day? Do your own thing, right? And in a way that none of us would want to curtail, but in a way that has important social ramifications. Um, in sum, I think Buckley and Mailer start these revolutions in the 1960s. And by the late 60s, early 70s, they watch these revolutions carry on by a younger generation and go off into extremes that neither one of them is terribly comfortable with. And that's why they become sort of calcified figures who are jokers on, in, in the playing cards at the end of the day. And we're living with the ramifications of both the left and the right demanding great numbers of freedom at the cost or lack of concern, maybe, for the greater common good. Um, through it all, fortunately for my book, they stayed friends. 
In the early 1970s, Playboy magazine asked uh, Buckley who he felt inferior to. And he sits there and he waffles around and says, oh, lots of people. And eventually he said, Norman Mailer. After all, he's a genius and I'm not. Of course, he's ruined more people's lives than I have. But still. I couldn't resist the urge. Mailer returned the favor um, in 1975. A charity group in, in, in um, New York City actually was presenting this at the Norman Mailer Society, which is a real thing. And um, after I gave a part of this talk and read this section of the book, um, this woman comes up to me who looks a lot like Norman Mailer, and it turns out to be Norman Mailer's daughter. And he said, oh, the charitable auction was for my prep school in New York City. So at a charitable auction, he auctions off an evening with William F. Buckley. And Mailer is the, the keynote. So I'll read from you the section that he wrote. He went full Buckley with this crazy, stupid, excessive vocabulary. Here to auction off an hour with that intellectual inchling. Oh, man, that's brewing inchling, right? In the pride of conservatism irrumpent, if not always ideological arrogate, I'm happy to say that the successful bidder will receive a full hour of conversation and attention from Sharon Connecticut's own Buckeen, William F. Buckley. We must breathe deep, avoid the ganch and gurley on, and prepare to bid up our wallets for the right to be received by that sclerodorical exponent of holophoresis, that natural practitioner of misosophony and misokania, that sedulous seek sour of the CIA, now rendered semi useless I fear, by the likes of Spiro Agno, but nonetheless phenomenally well worth bidding up if you have a taste for tongue tallying with America's own semi-paternal columnist, that upper Yahoo from Yale, Mr. William F. Buckley and his gang of trilly boobs. And they made several thousand dollars. After the auction, Mailer sends Buckley a clean copy of the speech, which I found in the archives. Dear Bill, yours to frame or flip away. And Buckley responded immediately, and he says, Dear Norman, thanks a million for the text of the introduction, which I shall attempt to decipher as soon as I find myself next to a substantial dictionary. I have not yet met the highest bidder, but I shall attempt to sound as you would have me sound. Let's meet soon, as ever, Bill. Thank you very much.